In A Clash of Kings, John goes on one of the most peculiar adventures with a man named Corin Halfhand and his crew of Stone Snake, Eben, and Squire Dalbridge. I say it's peculiar because, as presented, we either have to accept that Corrin Halfhand is one of the biggest idiots on Planetos and essentially more mentally impaired than Jingle Bell, or we have to accept something else. We have to accept that Corrin has some sort of secret motivation for all of these seemingly insane actions. What am I talking about? Well, let's go back and take a look at John's journey with the Halfhand. So, John's journey with Corrin spans the second half of the Clash of Kings, from John 5 to John 8. It can essentially be broken down into four events. There's one, the planning and formation of the team, two, the attack on Egret's watch party, three, the search for Ghost, and four, the running away and face-off with the Wildlings. Now, the planning and formation of the team occurs in John 5, soon after Corrin Halfhand's arrival at the Fist of the First Men. We should make note that we are introduced to Corrin as a controlled and methodical man. He is described as solemn, he is clean-shaven while everyone else has let their beards grow, he stands up straight, he chooses water over alcohol, and he chooses to eat a rather modest breakfast. When he speaks, he's all business, with few, if any, formalities. Everything about our first meeting with Corrin tells us that he's not a sloppy man who would make careless mistakes, which is why the forming of his little plan with his team seems all the more curious. You see, after arriving at the Fist of the First Men in John 5, Corrin tells Jior Mormont that they had captured a wildling, and Eben, an expert torturer, got a good amount of information from this captive. Mance is gathering in the Frost Fangs, searching for something, and he is planning to use sorcery to break the wall. Now later we find out that the thing that Mance is searching for is the Horn of Winter. Corrin's expert torturer got everything else from this wildling captive except the single most vital piece of information and this piece evaded our expert torturer as he apparently killed the man before he could reveal it. And thus it's the failure of Eben, a supposed expert torturer, that really brings about Corrin's plan in the first place. Corrin suggests that three scouting parties be sent out to find out what this sorceress item is. Gior is reluctant as he doesn't want to risk men, but Corrin convinces Gior otherwise by saying that men are supposed to die for the watch. It's a very dubious argument, but nonetheless, Gior is swayed. Corrin then inexplicably asks for Jon Snow to join his scouting party. Gior protests, saying that Jon is a boy, but Corrin's reasoning is that the old gods are strong beyond the wall, and they are the gods of the Starks. It's not really a reason that makes much sense at all. Is Corrin hoping for good luck? Is this really a legitimate reason for bringing Jon Snow? It's an extremely strange line of thinking, and an odd risk to take. Why bring a boy with no ranging experience into the Frost Fangs? He seems more like a liability than anything else. Corrin's crew of Eben, Stone Snake, and Squire Dalbridge are all seasoned rangers with unsurpassed abilities. What does Jon Snow bring to the table? Corrin later even brags about how he chooses certain people for missions based on their skill set. Why is Jon so special? Curiously, Corrin is also very focused on Jon's direwolf ghost. He asks about the direwolf upon first meeting Jon and closes the chapter telling Jon to find his wolf. Now, I will say, if there's a bigger liability than John on this trip, it's Ghost. We later find out that Ghost's white fur makes him stick out at night. The rest of the men are well camouflaged for night and the shadows that they travel in by wearing black, but Ghost is stark white. This is a detrimental quality specifically referenced by Corrin, and in the end, it is Ghost who is spotted by Orel's eagle. So what was Corrin thinking with all of this? Why would an experienced, solemn, methodical man risk his mission by bringing a green boy with no ranging experience and an eye-catching direwolf? In fact, the mission eventually does fail because of Ghost. Corrin choosing John and Ghost is a spectacularly bad move and one we're given no good answer for. So let's put a pin in this question of why Corrin chose John and Ghost for now. We will get back to this. When we next find our ranging party in John 6 A Clash of Kings, they have spotted a wildling fire atop the Skirling Pass. Corrin, quite stupidly and wrongly, declares that there are two people on the watch up there. Of course, there's no reason to assume two. There could be three, four, or five people for all anyone knows. Generally speaking, I would think three would be the minimum number of people for a watch, one to sleep, one to do the watch, and one to ensure the watcher stays awake by keeping him company. Nonetheless, for reasons, Corrin declares that there are two people and sends two men up to kill them. 
As expected, John, eager for affirmation, volunteers. And so Corin sends John and Stone Snake to make the climb. Of course, in the end, there aren't two wildlings on the watch. There are three. Corin was wrong. One of the wisest and most experienced men in the watch didn't know how many wildlings are normally on a watch party. Anyway, John and Stone Snake find three wildlings atop the pass, the Hornblower, Orel, and a sleeping egret. Stone Snake chooses the Hornblower to kill, leaving John with Orel. Now, Stone Snake is described as incredibly fast and is up against the Hornblower, who is specifically said to be unarmed because he went for his horn instead of his blade. Still, it's John who fights Orel, armed with a burning brand, and then John notices the stirring sleeper, decides he needs to finish off his opponent, kills Orel, and then has the time to put a dirk to Egret's throat. I am a bit surprised Stone Snake didn't make it to Egret first. In fact, Stone Snake admits that he was watching Egret and noticed that she went for her axe when John pounced on top of her. I suppose one could argue that the Hornblower was a far distance away, and thus John made it to Egret first, though it still sounds a tad off. What's more than a tad off is what comes next. John takes Egret prisoner, and Stone Snake then says it's useless to ask her questions, as wildlings will bite off their tongues rather than squeal. What? This is absolute lunacy to say. Eben, a professional wildling torturer, is at the bottom of the pass. Stone Snake knows very well that wildlings can be tortured for information. In fact, they are currently on a mission based on revealed intelligence from a tortured wildling. The kicker to this idiocy is that later on we find out that Egret knew all about the Horn of Winter. The mission could have been completed right here. Why isn't Egret being tortured for information? When Corrin arrives with Eben and Squire Dalbridge, Corrin immediately asks what would happen if he were captured by the wildlings. Egret says that he'd be tortured. Again, why isn't Egret being tortured? Eben, a professional wildling torturer, is right there, and Egret knows about the Horn of Winter, the entire reason they have ventured off into the Frostfangs. The scene is absolute, utter insanity. Anyway, Corrin tells John to do what needs to be done, and John lets Egret go. So there are many small mysteries around this encounter, but the large, unanswered question here is, why did Corrin let Egret go untortured? And again, we'll get back to this. So, following this incident in John 7 A Clash of Kings, Corrin and John then discuss Egret, and then Corrin commands John to go to sleep. At this point, John rests and he has a wolf dream where he's ghost, and then John, as ghost, talks to a werewood that he thinks is Bran, and then he sees the wildling camp with mammoths and giants, but he's interrupted because he's attacked by Orel's eagle. John wakes up and tells everyone about the incident. Now, this is what's weird Orel's eagle has spotted them. The eagle knows a warg is nearby, yet Corrin's crew presses on. Later, the eagle spots the entire party, and Corrin's crew presses on. It's only after finding Ghost that things change. Ghost at first appears injured, but then it turns out he can totally walk after all. The crew spends some time to dress Ghost's wound, and then, and only then, does Corrin announce that they have to turn back because the eagle has spotted them. Ugh, again, what? Orel spotted them ages ago. Why is Corrin now turning back? For Ghost? He's risking the lives of five men for a pet? A pet that shouldn't have been on the mission in the first place because of his conspicuous fur? And so we have another rather large mystery. Why did Corrin choose to rescue Ghost? And so it's on the final page of the John 7 chapter that the crew begins to run away. Now, the crew decides to travel at night, which proves slow going, as they can't see their way, and Eben even suggests torches, but Corrin insists no fire. The implication is that Corrin doesn't want to be seen, but Orel's eagle has been following them, and they are rather conspicuous with Ghost. Not to mention, they're traveling in a pass with nowhere to hide. At this point, they're not going to lose Orel's eagle. Speed is definitely more important than being seen. Anyway, Corrin then orders Squire Dalbridge to stay behind and hold the pass, thus sacrificing his life. Corrin claims that Dalbridge can hold off a hundred men, but Dalbridge seems to not delay the wildlings at all, which is odd, as in the end we find out there's only 14 of them in the pursuit. Eben is next to leave the party, he is to ride as fast as he can back the way they came, while the others head southwest. Of course, I'm not sure how heading southwest can possibly lead to the crew escaping, and again, Orel's eagle is watching them, and they're not going to lose the wildlings. Corrin and Stone Snake even waste time to double back to obscure tracks. John specifically calls this gesture futile, 
Eventually, Stone Snake leaves after his horse breaks a leg. At this point, Corrin finally decides to start building fires. Corrin tells John that he must go over to the Wildlings to find out what item they are seeking in the Frostfangs. Again, this is knowledge they could have gotten if they just tortured Egret. Corrin then decides to double back, riding not in the stream bed, which would have been faster, but close to the cliffs. They do manage to find an underground tunnel hidden by a waterfall, but Ghost proceeds to mark the territory with his urine, thus ruining the ruse. Not to mention, the Wildlings probably know this area anyway. Corrin then declares that the two of them will stay in the cave mouth to stand against the Wildlings. Of course, that doesn't happen. Egret thinks that John should come over, the Wildlings tell John to kill Corrin, and Corrin attacks John to create the pretense of a dispute. John kills Corrin, and the Wildlings take him in. So the Wildlings had an eagle and a pack of dogs for tracking. Knowing this about them, why did Corrin choose to try to hide rather than going for speed? The riding without torches, the obscuring of tracks, the doubling back, the heading in a completely wrong direction, it all seemed unlikely to work when the wildlings had tracking dogs and an eagle. Trying to outrun the wildlings seemed more likely to work. And so this is our fourth big question about Corrin's quest. Why try to hide when you can run? So going through the story, we have four big questions about this quest. Why did Corrin choose John and Ghost? Why did Corrin let Egret go untortured? Why did Corrin rescue Ghost? And why did he hide instead of run? Now each of these questions highlights an immense amount of incompetence from a seasoned Night's Watchman. Bringing a green boy and a conspicuous direwolf on an important quest? Not utilizing a torturer when you specifically brought one? Rescuing a conspicuous pet for no reason and valuing it over the lives of humans? Trying to hide from an eagle and a pack of tracking dogs while traveling with a conspicuous wolf who is peeing everywhere? It's almost comical, really, and at odds with every other aspect of Corrin that were presented. Why is a methodical, no-nonsense, veteran ranger making such boneheaded mistakes? And so let's try to find some logic here. Either Corrin is an absolute utter idiot, or he planned it all. He wanted to be caught, and wanted John to go over to the Wildlings from the very beginning, all the way back at the Fist of the First Men. Once we accept that, everything begins to make more sense. Why did Corrin rescue Ghost? Why hide instead of run? Why value a pet over the lives of men? Because he wanted to be caught. He wanted a white direwolf peeing everywhere that could be tracked by dogs and seen by an eagle. He wanted to go slowly in the escape and have the wildlings catch him. That's why he chose to travel at night with no torches. That's why Squire Dullbridge slowed no one at the pass. That's why Corrin pointlessly doubled back over and over again covering his tracks futilely. That's why Corrin didn't care when Ghost peed when they hid in the tunnel, and that's why they didn't end up fighting the wildlings in the mouth of the cave. Corrin's mission was all about being caught, from the very beginning. He just wanted to make it look like a pursuit to fool John and the wildlings. And this is also why he sacrificed the lives of his men, for the mission. Remember, at the beginning of the quest, he said that a Night's Watchman's whole reason for existing is to sacrifice his life in service of the realm. But let's talk about that first question. Why would Corrin choose John and Ghost? Let's be clear, Corrin chose John for a reason. Corrin even specifically tells John that he chooses his team members for a reason. Eben, Stone Snake, and Squire Dalbridge all have functions for Corrin. John must have one too. He even says as much when he tells Eben that John has a different part to play. So, why John? Why this random boy out of everyone else in the watch? Well, we have to remember that Corrin has never met John and essentially knows only a handful of things about him. He is a direwolf, he's a Stark, he saved the old bear, and that's about it. Yes, the direwolf could be used to facilitate being caught, but Corrin could probably work out getting captured in some other way. And he could probably convince lots of rangers to go over to the wildlings, ones he knows and trusts. So why Jon Snow? Could it be because Jon is a Stark? Why is being a Stark so important? Corrin brings up Jon's heritage several times during their trip. Well, let me first answer the second question. Why did Corrin let Egret go untortured? So it's rather clear that Corrin either already knew about the Horn of Winter or didn't care as he let Egret go despite having a professional torturer with him. So the mission isn't really about the Horn of Winter. So what's really going on? Why go into the Frostfangs in the first place? Well, let's start with the presumption that Corrin Halfhand knows the lands beyond the wall. He is said to have ventured into the wild farther than anyone else. And he kind of proves this when he leads John into a secret tunnel. Whether it be through personal experience or rumor, he knows the area. So it stands to reason that Corrin knows about the Skirling Pass and knows that wildlings would be watching there. Also, with so many years in the watch, he also likely knows wildlings and their practices. 
He would know how many people would be in a wildling watch party, and the makeup. In fact, that captured, tortured wildling that started this whole quest may have told them exactly how many people would be in the Skirling Pass. He may have even given names. All in all, I would say there is a very good chance that Corrin already knew what was waiting for them in the Skirling Pass, that there would be two men and a spearwife there. And Corrin also likely knew that a son of Eddard Stark and a nephew of Benjen Stark would be honor-obsessed. And so, in all likelihood, Corrin knew John wouldn't kill a woman. In fact, later on, Corrin essentially admits this to John. He told John to do what needed to be done, figuring John would not kill Egret and would let her go. Now, Corrin has been in the Watch a long time and probably knows a lot about wildlings, so he likely also knows that capturing a woman is the wildling equivalent to marriage. So Corrin could probably also assume that if John didn't kill the spearwife, the spearwife would view him as a husband in a wildling cultural sense. In fact, as it happens, the night that Corrin made John make his climb was a night that was astrologically lucky for wildling marriages. So why did Corrin let Egret go untortured? Because she was John's in to the wildlings. Corrin tricked John into marrying Egret so that she would vouch for him. In fact, John admits to Corrin that Egret asked him to come over, and Corrin acts utterly unsurprised. And now let's talk about why being a Stark is important. John and Egret have a long discussion before Corrin, Squire Dalbridge, and Eben make it to the top of the pass. Egret proceeds to tell the story of Bale the Bard. It's a story of how the Starks of Winterfell have wildling blood in them. Egret tells John that he's just as much a wildling as Arell and the Hornblower. And this interpretation does not go over John's head. John tells Corrin that the story of Bale the Bard is about how the Starks and the wildlings are kin. And keep in mind, Corrin said something very similar when he chose John for the mission. He said the old gods are still strong beyond the wall, the gods of the first men, and the Starks. The Starks and the wildlings are similar. And Corrin even reinforces the idea that the wildlings are not some different breed to John. Only fools like Thor and Smallwood despise the wildlings. They are as brave as we are, John. As strong, as quick, as clever. But they have no discipline. They name themselves the Free Folk, and each one thinks himself as good as a king, and wiser than a maester. Mance was the same. He never learned how to obey. No more than me, said John quietly. So, all in all, we find out that John is even more special than we thought. Not only is John a Stark, but he has wildling blood. Or at least the wildlings believe that he has wildling blood. And it's interesting that of all the people in the Watch that Corrin picked to come with him, he picked the one person in the Watch who had wildling blood. He picked the one person who might be considered kin with the wildlings. And rather significantly, he picked the one person who is like Mance Raider. That is, he's part wildling and a former black brother. And John even admits that he's like Mance Raider and wildlings. He can't obey. Once we accept that Corrin wanted John to join the wildlings from the beginning, everything else starts falling into place. John was selected because he's the perfect mole. Now, there is one big problem here. Corrin letting Egret go shows that he doesn't really care about the Horn of Winter and possibly already knew about it. So what's the purpose of having John go over to the Wildlings if not to find out about the Horn? Well, we will get into the real reason Corrin sent John over to the Wildlings in part two. We will see you next time.